Aita, thank you very much. Uh, it is a really great to be here. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, conference. I think a lot of the uh, presentations today have, have discussed the same, same issues that I have. I have here to present, so I think these, these fit together really well. Uh, so my work uh, focuses on mostly on media and solidarity, but then of course also the kind of um, conditions where, where we are now and how we should, what we should do to, to engender more solidarity in these times that are very difficult for many reasons. Uh, so, I try to move on with the slide, but don't seem to be able to get further. Oh. Hmm. Technical problem. There we go. Sorry about that. So, uh, as uh, has been said uh, many in previous uh, uh, presentations, uh, media is important because it provides us the possibility of knowing, of learning about the world where we live in. So, uh, media is extremely important in providing information and understanding of, of social and political issues. And it also shapes the way we are in relation to others and how we find uh, what we think about where uh, about ourselves and our identities and, and so on. So it, it's extremely important in that sense. And as we have learned today, there are many different ways in which media does that, the news media and, and social media, and as well as, as entertainment and, and um, uh, media that's focusing on, for example, uh, reality shows, television, as a kind of social uh, uh, space where people gather. So there are many different ways that media does that. Um, and then if we think about the uh, question of, of uh, refugees and migrants, uh, my work has looked at, for example, the, the so-called European refugee crisis in 2015, but also long before that, how media depicted refugees and immigrants. How do we learn about, their, uh, uh, about them from the, from the mainstream media? And I think the previous... Uh, presentations also touched upon this. But um, uh, one of the uh, imageries that media depicts that is very familiar and it seems to be quite consistent is the way it dehumanizes uh, migrants and refugees. Um, and this, this is uh, because the perspective uh, usually in media representations, is very much about the governance and control. So there is this kind of idea that we have to control and govern something that is usually presented for us in terms of figures or uh, uh, different kinds of maps and graphs, uh, arrows. So, so this creates a kind of sense of, of uh, non-humans. And then the, these presentations are also connected with different metaphors, which was also in, in Jima's presentation, the kind of idea of, of floods and flows, uh, uh, waves that are uh, entering to, to our countries. So uh, these are these kind of um, uh, ways in which media dehumanizes refugees and migrants, and, and this kind of uh, discourse is, is quite common, and it has been like that for, for, for a long time. This is nothing novel or new, but of course, during the so-called refugee crisis in 2015, this was emphasized quite a lot. 
Uh, another way that uh, media depicts uh, migrants and refugees and asylum seekers is connected to a kind of excessive sentimentality. And this is the kind of emotional narrative that usually depicts individual um, survival stories of refugees that have uh, encountered a difficult journey or have survived exceptional um, conditions. And of course, uh, these narratives are connected with a kind of idea of gratitude, humility, and victimhood. Um, and in many ways, you may ask, well, what is wrong with that? The, the problem or the critical view to that is that uh, it often also poses so-called ideal victims that we um, uh, find in, for example, women and children are usually ideal victims. And the ideal victims have to be, have to be in a way, apolitical. They can't, they can't, uh, do anything, anything that's controversial or wrong or, or challenge their position. They have to, have to gratefully accept it. And um, uh, this is one of the problems why we, we then tend to see or want to see migrants and refugees as certain type of people, ideal people who are probably uh, different from us in that sense, that they are almost above us more or they should be above us in many ways. Um, and that is also in its own way, dehumanizing element. And it also uh, contributes to the idea that there are certain people whose lives are worth grieving and some people's lives are not worth grieving. Um, and of course, with the emotional narrative, I don't say that, that uh, or I'm not against emotions, because uh, emotions are important. They drive social and political action. Uh, it is important that we are moved and touched by the faith of other people. But uh, it is more about how our emotions are crafted and to what ends and what comes out of it. So this sort of excessive, excessive sentimentality in media may not really bring out any kind of deeper understanding about inequalities, or it doesn't necessarily solve, solve uh, issues uh, of inequality and injustice. But today we are faced with, uh, with a, uh, many, many challenges in the media environment. And this, I think, has also been referred to in, in the previous presentations, uh, connected, for example, to the way the whole media landscape has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. And when we think about how people use media, uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it has become so diverse that it's very difficult to find that kind of cohesive or shared space of media. So uh, digitalization and datification of media environment uh, has, has carried complex uh, consequences for, for public discussion and political cultures. So we have this kind of concurrent, uh, 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 concurrent uh, phenomenon of enhancing and deconstructing democracy. In a way, in a digital culture, we can, we can see more people can come together, but then at the same time, we can see how there are uh, increasingly different kinds of filter bubbles and echo chambers where people are, are more and more separate. Um, so there are kind of parallel and conflictual debates and universes on social media. It is also algorithmically shaped environment, which means that the, the kind of platform ecology and digital infrastructures already shape, shape the environment in ways that we don't necessarily, we are not always aware of that and produces these kind of distinct social worlds. Uh, and this uh, is connected with the growing mistrust to legacy media and governmental institutions, where we see all these con conspiracy theories, fake news and manipulation taking place. So this is a very complex and conflictual environment that we are now operating. And as some of the research has shown, 
uh, young people are now mostly on social media, getting all their news information and, and media engagement is through social media. And more and more people are using uh, merely digital devices. And then, of course, the thing that's very much connected to this is the rise of the far right everywhere in the world, basically. We see it in Europe, in the US, in South America, in Asia, uh, in Australia, in different ways. So uh, what I have seen in my research is that the, the right wing populism, uh, they, they've been able to make a really um, systematic use of of social media and its logistical aspects, being able to build communities of hate and, and making use of their transnational networks. And they are usually politically much more influential than their size. And the transnational networks operate, for example, that the uh, ECRE from Estonia is kind of connected with the, with the Finnish sites and translating the sites from Finland. Uh, Finnish groups are connected with the US and Swedish groups and so on. And a lot of these uh, groups share the same kind of messages. And these messages are uh, very clearly uh, racist, anti-immigrant and uh, share the kind of same arguments, some of those arguments that came out in, in the previous uh, presentations today. So what this is, is, is very much about politics of irony, using a kind of humor, memes, mimic culture from the, from the social media. Uh, and then also politics of fear, the kind of uh, threat imagery uh, where we see uh, others, immigrants and, and refugees as a, as a constant threat to our societies. But then, of course, we also see that there is, um, uh, at the same time, we see the, the rise of different kinds of solidarity movements and voices from the margins. Um, I have done research on, on various solidarity groups or campaigns that enhance, try to enhance solidarity from below. Uh, one of them is um, a campaign called Once a Refugee that was uh, formed by people who live in Finland, who, who used to, who came here as refugees, who are now, now uh, working, studying, uh, living their lives. And uh, in this Facebook campaign, they would um, post their picture with a, with a sign that would say, once I was a refugee, now I'm a nurse, or now I'm a, I'm a DJ, now I'm a doctor, or now I'm studying, or, things like that to show that it's not a just um, uh, eternal position that you can become part of the society if if the society uh, uh, allows you to become part of that. Uh, and this was really interesting campaign because it involved a lot of young young people from different backgrounds and it was a very positive in its energy, but it actually really talked back to the, to the ways in which the uh, anti-immigrant movement and the hate groups have had been kind of targeting uh, migrants and refugees. So it was a kind of counter, counter and solidaristic uh, move uh, against that kind of discourse. And of course, social media can provide these kind of uh, examples. And there are other citizen journalism, uh, um, films, uh, social documentaries that are made made from this perspective. So there are opportunities to, to talk back in different ways. Um, so my work has very much focused on trying to think how to create spaces of, of connection and, and solidarity. Um, and this is not easy at all because on um, uh, it usually takes a lot of time and effort and it's not necessarily a um, kind of a cheap way to produce news or media content. Um, but what I found out uh, looking at different kinds of media representations and media productions 
uh, it is quite clear that that uh, the the productions need to be somehow collaborative uh, with a kind of dialogue with with uh, people that are involved, different people from the society. Uh, we, we have the tendency to talk uh, above those people who are uh, the object of discussion. For example, in terms of immigration, we often talk about them without them. And uh, I think in, in these kind of more solidaristic media, um, productions, you need to have this aspect of collaboration that comes from below. Uh, and with a, with a real uh, uh, desire to listen to the other. And of course, this requires some kind of openness and maybe a creation of, of more unconventional productions with new kind of genres. You can't necessarily do that with a, with a sort of cost efficient rationalized media production that that many of the media companies are leaning on. So there has to be a kind of new practices at place as well, different kinds of, of collaborations. And, uh, uh, and therefore, it's really important to ask whose, whose perspectives are being told or offered and who are the who are producing these news and narratives? Who are working in the media, for example? What kind of um, uh, process is involved in creating contents? Um, so I also suggest that instead of reacting to events, what I think the media does very much, uh, uh, and and kind of emphasizes polarization in different ways through the media structures, but also through, through uh, trying to build more attention through conflicts and debates. Uh, media should more uh, focus on provide and, and provide ways of imagining uh, uh, kind of uh, and discussing futures where we can we can be together and a kind of new ways of imagining those futures. So from a very reactive and and polarized uh, reporting towards more more thinking about the possibilities and futures. And some of the examples that I've thought um, have been quite interesting in, in the past years are connected, for example, social documentary. Uh, that is a very fast growing area of media production because it's more, um, it's cheaper to produce now and easier to produce than before. So it can be also done from a grassroots level. Um, and it can make really, really important connection to global events and local situations. Um, and uh, it can be produced with a different kind of interesting collaborations also with uh, media, art institutions and the civil society. And there are some of really compelling and interesting um, uh, documentaries such as the Midnight Traveler, which is a story of one family and how they travel across Europe. And it's compelling because it it, it really addresses and shows the, the the humanity in us and nothing nothing that's too ideal, sentimental or too um, kind of uh, distantiated and uh, emphasizing difference. So there is a uh, connection to us as as humans in a very compelling way. And that's all I had to say today. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Some of these issues that I, I talked are also in, in these um, sources that you may find interesting. Thank you all.